Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ronnie Laralde. I'm the executive director of the Edinburgh Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today for uh, this month's Caffeine with Colleagues. Um, obviously, this is a, 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 the new way of doing things right now um, via Zoom. So I appreciate you all jumping on um, the online today to, to join us for this very important topic. Um, before we get started, you know, uh, we have a, a good set of speakers today that are talking to you to us about the importance of September and uh, mental health and um, suicide prevention month. So these are very important topics that I feel um, that we uh, discussed as a board and a staff that, that it was very important for us to, to bring the light and uh, to talk about it. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to introduce a, a couple or just uh, um, say a couple of uh, people that are on our call that were this morning. Uh, Mr. Mario Lescano, he's our VP of Public Affairs. He's on as well. He's one of our board members. Uh, he's with DHR Health. Um, uh, Marsha Green, she's with uh, Bert Ogden uh, Dealer Group, and thank you for joining. She's also one of our board members. I also see uh, Jennifer Garza with the uh, Centene Group um, that's on here as well. Um, I wanted to recognize them and thank them for everything they do uh, for our community. So um, with that said, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I know mental health is an important part of overall health and well-being. Uh, mental health includes you know, everything from emotions to um, psychological to our social well-being. It affects um, how we feel and how we act. So it also you know, det determines how we handle stress and uh, or make healthy choices. So um, mental health has affected us you know, from every part of our life as kids. Uh, from our childhood to our adolescence to adulthood now, you know, through this pandemic. Um, so um, with that said, I wanted to start with uh, the CEO, Mr. Joe Rodriguez. Uh, he's with South Texas uh, Health System Behavioral here in Edinburgh. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. And uh, please thank you, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all. And Thank you for the invitation to the Board of uh, Chamber of Commerce and to all the speakers here today from UTRGV. So thank you and thank you for the partnership. I think it's extremely important for us to, to be together working in a partnership for, for something that is very important in the community and that's uh, mental health and everything that's going on today in all over the U.S. really and all over the world with what people, with things that are going on with this pandemic and the things that uh, we're having to change and uh, it, it changed our whole lives. It changed our whole lives, our personal lives for all of us in this in this call and this Zoom call, this Zoom meeting, and for our families. And uh, we see it with our patient population here. So, uh, first, let me let me tell you about a little bit about ourselves. We we are a 134 bed hospital. We treat uh, kids as young as three years old and uh, adults up to the age of 90, 100 years old. Uh, we treat from uh, depression to anxiety to chemical dependence. So uh, we, we've been, we're the largest behavioral health hospital in, 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 uh, in South Texas. Uh, we've been in this field for nine, since 1985 at the McAllen Medical Center where we first started and then we built a replacement facility here in uh, 2006. So it's something that we have been committed to the community for a long time. Uh, I'm from the Valley. I was born and raised here in Nelson, Texas, which is just a few miles away from Edinburgh. And I've uh, been with the company for 30 years. Uh, all of my, my background experience has been working with uh, mental health. I started at 17 with a local MHMR, Tropical Texas. So uh, I've been around. I, I, I know the community. I, I know the people in the community. I know the doctors, uh, I, the, the psychiatrists in the area. So uh, it helps it helps me to, to be able to have that relationship with, with the doctors in the community. But also important for me is having the relationship with the community, with business persons in, in, our, in our community with a partnership with UTRGV and the different uh, managed Medicaid companies. And I know Jennifer is on the call. So uh, thank you, Jennifer, for being on the meeting here today. Uh, we've known each other for a long time. So, you know, again, I, I, I welcome the opportunity to be here and open to questions. You're on mute, Ronnie. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. Um, I, I decided to join. My name is Alex Rios. I'm a past chairman of the board for the Edinburgh Chamber of Commerce. 
And uh, I'm also a volunteer, I continue to be a volunteer for the chamber. And, um, you know, this was uh, something that was near and dear to my heart because uh, for six and a half years, I got to work with Representative Terry Canales out of House District 40, uh, which your hometown happens to be part of our district, uh, the Delta area. And one of the things that I feel, and this is just a personal opinion, uh, I'm not speaking for anybody other than myself, that what is y'all's relationship with our legislators? I, I feel like, you know, especially with uh, our times today, with uh, people suffering from mental health, whether it be because of the COVID or it be something that they've been going through the, uh, all their lives. You know, we know this is not, not new. You know, what is the push that you guys have with our legislators to ensure that mental health is something that we're taking very serious? Um, and in addition, my second question is, how do you feel about additional training for police officers to be able to deal with people suffering from mental uh, health issues and that they know how to treat these people. As you probably know, a lot of people with mental health end up dying in the hands of police officers because they don't know how to act themselves out. So uh, what would be your position uh, here, especially in the Valley, to talk to our legislators about this very important topic? Well, I think, Mr. Rios, thank you for those questions, uh, very important questions. So, I mean, we, every year, we work very closely with our legislators. Uh, from, from having a day in Austin, a UHS day in Austin, which is us, which is uh, University, which is our parent, uh, our parent company. And uh, we, we meet with all, with the uh, representatives in Austin. We meet with them here. We, we go to their offices. We meet with them personally. We have uh, individuals that are working in Austin on a daily basis. Uh, they are lobbyists for behavioral health under UHS. Uh, we have a total of over 300 behavioral hospitals nationwide. So we are very active, not only in the, in the local and the state, but also in the federal level in trying to get more funding for, for behavioral health services. A lot of the funding that comes in may not be directly for us. It could be for the local MHMR because of the number of patients that we have in the area that are indigent. So there, and so we, yes, to answer your question, we work very closely uh, with Terry Canales, with uh, Sergio Munoz uh, Jr. We work very closely with Chuy Hinojosa, uh, you know, all the different reps that we have and, and the senators. Uh, so we, we do. And also, I, uh, the, we provide a lot of training. We're always very open to, to train police officers in the community. We've talked to them. We provide training on, on depression, on suicide. We provided parts for them on the different illnesses that they carry with them, different medications. If a patient, if they do stop a patient and they see that he's got medication in his pocket, they know what the medications are about. We try to, of course, there's a lot of changes in, in staff in different uh, police departments that we gotta, we constantly have to be going back. We work very closely with Edinburgh PD. Edinburgh PD, our, uh, our relationship with them has always been great and uh, very understanding. We work very closely with the officers uh, from the local MHMR. Uh, they have, uh, from Tropical Texas, they have trained officers that are bringing patients in from the local MHMR, from the community, from home. These are officers that are trained, and, and, and it has made such a difference for me from maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, a lot of these patients were just taken into custody and, and uh, you know, uh, handcuffed and in shackles, and now it's very different. You know, it's very different now for us here, uh, where we're seeing that, that, that there's a lot more respect for mental health, a lot more respect for patients that are in their emergency room, that are home, that are suicidal or homicidal. We're seeing a lot of that right now. We see that because people are confined to home. We're seeing where patients are not following up with their with their medication regime. They're not following up with their doctors. So uh, the patients that we are getting in the hospital, we're not getting as much as much patients that we had before. But the ones that we're getting right now are very sick, and because they're not they're not taking care of themselves, and it's very difficult because of everything that's going on. A lot of depression, a lot of severe anxiety right now. So, uh, so yes, to answer your question, we work with Edinburgh PD, we work with Hartford Police Department, McAllen PD, that we've done some training with them. We've gone as far as Brownsville and uh, all the Valley to, we've invited them for, for different meetings here. We, we're gonna continue this year, but because of the COVID and uh, you know, no more, no more than 10 people in them, we've kind of limited our, our presentations. We're working with all the school districts right now, the McAllen, Edinburgh, PSJA, the different schools in the area where we're providing training on how to handle patients that, that are suicidal, homicidal, or depressed, 
the kids especially, you know, because we're seeing right now school has school just started and we already have about a good 15 adolescents in our hospital right now. We got 10 children in the hospital. So we're seeing those, those type of things for you. So yes, we're, we're, we're always committed and always, always willing to help. Uh, we're here on the corner of Trenton and Jackson. Anything that you need or anything that you need for me to do, just please call me and, and we're, we're open to help out in any area. Thank you for your response. Good. I hope I, hope I answered your question, sir. You did. Uh, you did. I, I just, uh, you know, I was curious because one of the things that I was pushing as a director was, you know, to almost make it into law to have more training because we are seeing more and more, you know, mental health issues. Uh, just yesterday, I had to drive in emergency to to a location where a friend was going through a mental breakdown. And, you know, it makes me wonder, you know, are we pushing this enough? You know, are we giving out now the chamber is doing a remarkable job doing this because it allows people to kind of tune in and listen to some of the scenarios that are going on. Right. But it just seems that a lot of people are scared to talk about it because of categorization. You know, are they going to think that I'm crazy? Are they going to think that I'm, you know, and so, uh, could you give us information if somebody wants to get screened but doesn't want to get input into the, I don't know if you even have that, but for somebody who feels like, hey, I'm going through this situation where I feel like I'm going through a mental breakdown, do you have anything for those people? Yeah, we definitely. We, we're open 24 hours, seven days a week, and they can call our, our hotline. Our main number here is 388-1300. Doesn't mean that the, the person is calling is going to be admitted. Uh, definitely, we talk to them over the phone, find out what's going on. We invite them over for because we want to know personally what's going on with them and for them to, to come to our hospital. Uh, and then at that point, we make the referral whether the patient is in need of hospitalization. And if they're not in need of hospital, hospitalization is our last resort. That, that we use that as a last resort. Many people are afraid to come to hospitals because they feel like we're going to keep them in the hospital. But that's not our case. Our case is to, to evaluate them, to assess, have the doctor see them if they need to be seen. Uh, a lot of times when they come here, uh, we, we try to get expedite the, the, uh, uh, the appointment with our psychiatrist, with a therapist in the community. A lot of times they don't need a psychiatrist. A lot of times they need a therapist, someone that they can talk to. Uh, and, and that's what we do. That's, that's our job. We, we get over 600 calls a month here from patients that are calling that are suicidal, or depressed or just without severe anxiety. And our, our job is to make sure that that person gets the proper help that they need. But yes, we're open 24 hours, seven days a week for the community. 388-1300 was the number? That's the, that's the number, 388-1300. Thank, thank, thank you so much for that information. Very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Rios. Appreciate you very much. Thank you, Alex. I went ahead and typed the number on our chat. If you, if you guys are want to have uh, additional questions, um, for both our speakers, um, you can type them on our chat as well, and I can go ahead and ask the question on, on your behalf. Um, before we continue, um, I wanted to point out, you know, you know, Mr. Rodriguez, thank you. Um, everything that you, you've talked about, and of course, we're in an important time. We've just started school. You know, a lot of um, um, educators are going through something new. Kids are going through something new. Um, it's a lot of stress. But um, there's a tracking poll conducted by uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, and in mid-July, 53% of adults in the United States reported that their mental health has negatively been impacted due to worry and stress over, over COVID. Um, this is actually higher than the 32% that was reported in March. Um, so it's a very important topic to be, to be discussing and of course, you know, this is like a new layer of, of, of stress with having, you know, to have kids at home, work at home. And um, it's a lot of uh, new uh, issues that are arising and mental stress has increased. Um, so, um, Alex, thank you for those questions. It's very important that the government and our, our health um, uh, facilities are working uh, together, you know, not only because of COVID, you know, and continuous, but um, um, also with mental health. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Rodriguez, thank you for, for joining us today. Um, we'll have, uh, we're gonna have another speaker talk. Um, before that, um, I wanted to ask one more question to you, Mr. Rodriguez. 
coming in from um, Aaron Salinas. His question is, so hospitals are being overwhelmed due to COVID and in addition to other issues, um, what does South Texas Behavioral have to support the additional needs? Well, I, I think for us, I, we, we were very fortunate and blessed that we were, being that our hospital is uh, 134 beds, we were able to open up a COVID unit for behavioral patients. So patients that were coming in that were positive for COVID, uh, that, that did not have, that were maybe asymptomatic or maybe just a minor symptom that did not require hospitalization in the acute hospital, because our behavioral health is very different. We just, you know, we don't treat with IVs or uh, oxygen or anything like that because people can get hurt with those things. So uh, if, if the person is coming in and is positive COVID, we're not going to refuse them. We will take them into our hospital and we opened up a unit, a 28-bed unit uh, for COVID patients and all of our staff are trained. And uh, so that's what we did. We opened up another small unit on the, uh, that was for adult and geriatric. And then we opened up a small unit also uh, a total of eight beds for child and adolescent also. So we, we're prepared because I don't think this thing is going to go away. It's going to continue to be with us for the next few months uh, with flu season coming up, and we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, nobody really knows about what, how long COVID is going to be with us. So we're preparing ourselves to, to be prepared for at least the winter months and, uh, and be able to take some of the patients in here. So the patient doesn't have to be at home suffering from covid and concerned that at least they'll be here and we'll provide the therapy, we'll provide whatever whatever we need to provide to that patient that he or she is gonna feel very comfortable. Uh, but yes, I mean, we, we do, we have had, at one time we even had up to 16, 18 patients, I'm sorry, in our COVID unit also at one time. And we've had, uh, the youngest that we've had uh, this last week was 10 years old, they came in with positive COVID. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Great to hear. Um, and thank you for all the great work, you guys. Obviously, this is something new that you all had to pivot as a behavioral center to adjust and help your counterparts with, you know, the Edinburgh Hospital and um, to make uh, make space and and try to help this crisis that, you know, our entire community is going through. Um, so we thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another thing that I wanted to say, Ron, is that uh, other things that we're seeing here be, because uh, September, of course, is National Suicide Prevention Month, and we're working with the community. We had we had a moment of silence here. We invited Edinburgh Police Department, the school police department, the sheriff's office also, and people from the community to join us in a, in a, in a moment of silence. Uh, this was last week that we did it here. So we're very committed to working with the community on suicide prevention and mental health month that are coming up also. Uh, another thing that we're seeing also is that we're seeing a lot of uh, domestic violence. Uh, these are patients that are at home uh, or individuals that are at home, not necessarily patients, but they could be at home, they lost a job and they're home with their spouse and their kids. And so we are we are getting those calls where uh, the husband is extremely abusive with the wife or with the kids and getting very restless with the kids because they're home all day and they can't, they're not able to help the kids with their homework and their duties. And uh, so we all need to be aware in the community that these things are happening and these are serious things that, that are happening in our community also with domestic violence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reeves. We appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Um, you know, we talked about it, you know, being in uncharted waters and education starting. The, um, and of course, you know, we're home to the university and they're great partners of ours. And uh, we reached out to their, their counseling center to talk about, um, about this issue. And, and um, I know they have a, a center on campus um, that a lot of people don't know about that helps um, with you know, suicide prevention, um, with therapists. Um, so we invited uh, UTRGV counseling center, Maria Alejandra Masariegos, I think I said it right, um, to join us as well to talk about uh, this important topic uh, Maria, thank you for joining us this morning. Absolutely. Hi, good morning. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. And I'm really thankful to the Edinburgh Chamber and to everyone who's joining us today. And so I know it's called Coffee with Colleagues. So I wonder how many of you guys have your morning brew with you? Or maybe you've already consumed it. You don't, yes, right? So, so you know, we're going to talk about things that aren't necessarily light, you know, but they're so important 
important. And so I think it's a great idea to have something that can bring us pleasure and, you know, taste delicious um, with us. So that's great. So I made a little PowerPoint for us because I don't know about you guys, but I'm a visual kind of learner. And I know a lot of us ever since, you know, March have been on like Zoom calls every day, a lot of the day. And so I don't know about you guys, but I like to see a little color in my screen occasionally. So um, I'm here today to really represent UTRGD, the Counseling Center, and let you all know of some resources and also some takeaways that, that we can all apply to, to our life. Like I said, I am a clinical therapist with UTRGD Counseling Center. And I've been at the university for about five years, actually, earlier this month. It was my fifth year anniversary. And outside in the community, I own a private practice called Love Interior Psychotherapy. So here today, we're all gathered to talk mental health. And it was really nice to see some active questions, and they were excellent questions. And so when we think about mental health, a lot of times we stay a little bit silent about it. Because when we talk about our physical health, and you guys tell me if, how it is for you, but it seems like we're more willing to tell someone, my stomach hurts, I have a headache, you know what, I have a doctor's appointment that day, I need to like, you know, miss work, or I need a couple of days off, or I need to cancel our meeting because I have a doctor's appointment. And so that's very much accepted. We don't question it. But how many of us would feel comfortably saying, you know what, I need to miss half a day of work because I'm going to go talk to a therapist. Or because I'm feeling so stressed out and overwhelmed, or you know what, actually, I just feel like I need a mental health day. And so I'm taking the day off, not necessarily to do anything productive, but just to take care of my mental health, which is actually one of the most productive things we can do. Because a lot of research has shown us that the more we take care of our mental and emotional health, we're actually able to be more productive in our other aspects. So mental health is health. And mental health is part of physical health and wellness. Because whenever we have downfalls or we kind of let go of our mental health, our physical health follows. And a lot of things regarding mental health have physical symptoms that manifest. So it's important that, that we talk about mental health and that we normalize it. And so um, it's important to know, like it was mentioned, that it is Suicide Prevention Month. And there's a lot of stigma around it. And it's important to know that suicidal ideations can happen to anyone and that it doesn't discriminate. And so when we talk about mental health, Suicidal ideations can kind of be the other side of the spectrum, right? So mental health is this wide range of, of things that includes, yes, like self-care and feeling joy, but it also can mean taking care of our worries, putting things in order so we don't feel worried. And sometimes whenever a person feels overwhelmed or hopeless or like there's really no solution, their brains will really take them to some thoughts that they might have never expected. And so that's why I think it's so important to know that suicidal ideations, they can happen to anyone. However, just because someone has an ideation or a thought of wanting to harm themselves doesn't mean that they're going to end their life. And so we can go over to the next one. I'd like to show you some statistics um, that were recently provided. And so if we see, this is the latest data that we have. And so typically when it comes to data about health and mental health, it takes a couple of years before it's put out there. So in this case, we have the 2018 statistics. And so what we know is that in the U.S., about 9.8 million adults have serious thoughts of ending their life. By serious thoughts, this means they may be made a plan, they have contemplated it, perhaps even acquired means. So 9.8 million, of those 9.8 million, 2.8 made a suicide plan, right? So they took it up, like, okay, I'm going to, to make a plan and figure out how I'm going to do this. And of those, 1.3 
put action to their plan. And so if you see, that's a big range, right? So from 9.8 that considered suicide, 1.3 attempted it. So what we know is that many, many millions of individuals who may be thinking about suicide aren't necessarily going to attempt against themselves. And that's because sometimes our brain takes us to suicidal ideation because we feel we just don't have a solution, you know? And so it's, it's been heard before and sometimes it's a little cliche, but suicide is really a, a, a permanent problem to temporary, a permanent solution, right? To temporary problems. And so it's important that we have these conversations when we're feeling overwhelmed so that our brain doesn't kind of go there, right? And so what we know is that of those 1.3 who attempted suicide, only 0.3 million of those adults kind of were not really showing any signs. So look at that big discrepancy, right? Between 9.8 and 0.3 who just showed really no signs. So what that tells us is, and if uh, we can go to the next slide, is that suicide is very much preventable. And so it's actually the most preventable cause of death. And so that in itself should inspire a lot of hope that with accurate care, with accurate conversations, with breaking down stigma, with learning about our personal mental health, we can prevent suicide. And that's really powerful to know. You know, and so, and this is, and suicide prevention is a lot of times we think, well, you know, it's the physician's job or it's a, a therapist's job or things like that. But really it's, it's all our jobs because we're the ones in the community and we're the experts in ourselves and we're the ones who have access to our family members and our friends. And so if you could go to the next slide, that would be great. So we know suicide is preventable, but we have to know how to intervene, right? And so these are some stereotypical warning signs that maybe somebody might be thinking about suicide. And so it's broken down into three main categories. Certain talk, like feeling hopelessness, feeling trapped. It can also be certain behaviors that people exhibit. And it can also be mood. So Undiagnosed and untreated depression is one of the leading causes of suicide and suicidal ideation. And so what that tells us is if that we're able to understand our mood and we're able to sort of intervene and listen to ourselves and listen to our bodies and our brain and our emotions and our heart about what we need, we can actually prevent our mood from changing and dipping. And so these are suicide warning signs that have been studied um, throughout many, many years. And so these are sort of like red flags. However, it's important to know that this is not like a cookie cutter or a formula, that there may be people who have none of these warning signs. And then we just hear, you know, of the tragic news. And then there may be people who have, you know, 90% of what's on the slide, and yet maybe they've never considered suicide. So it's important to know that it's not a cookie cutter approach. This is just sort of like, FYI, these are some warning signs. If you see this in yourself, if you see this in a loved one, maybe it's time to have that conversation about how are you really feeling? So we can go to the next slide, please. And so what we know is that human connection and social support is really the key to suicide prevention. And so human connection, that means having conversations. That means talking about our great days, but talking about those days that we wish we could just erase off the calendar and talking about resources that are available and what is out there in our community. Because there's a lot of resources in our community here in the RGB that sometimes are not utilized simply because we don't know they exist or also because of there's a lot of stigma. But that's for that human connection. You know, we can encourage people to, to try things out. Think of a time when you maybe, you know, and this is again, pre-COVID time, when you may have gone to a new restaurant, right? 
or you went to this restaurant and you just had a great meal and you probably told your family and friends about it. You were like, you know what? You should go check this place out. Like it is so good. Like I heard you like this kind of food. You're really going to love it. So I wonder what would happen if we had those same kind of conversations about our emotions. Like, hey, you know what? I was really feeling down the other day and I did X, Y, Z activity and that made me feel a lot better. It didn't solve my problem, but it sure made my mood better for that day. And so I think that's something I'm going to try out from now on. How often do we really have those kind of conversations? Probably not as often, but part of this, like today, everyone who's here, you know, we're here to sort of start conversations, um, that kind of thing. So human connection and social support is key, not only to suicide prevention, but also to our mental health and to breaking down that stigma. And so if you want to go to the next slide, please. And so what we know is that anyone can prevent and save a life. You don't have to have a certain level of education, specialties, licenses, certain age. No. If you're willing to offer someone hope, if you're willing to offer them your company, and you're willing to be a bridge to resources, you're doing suicide prevention. And so weight is a really, really neat kind of way to remember it, right? Because about suicide prevention is we need to buy time. You know, and if you think about a time that maybe not that you were feeling suicidal, but a time that you were feeling really overwhelmed in your life and all your emotions and all your thoughts and everything that may have been running through your mind. Sometimes when we wait a little bit or like we say, we sleep on it or we talk about it and we get assurance or we get a hug from someone, it doesn't make our problem go away but it makes us feel better. And so when it comes to suicide and suicide prevention, it's important to watch out for signs of distress and changes in behavior. So that previous graphic that had those three different um, sections and asking, this one really is what's gonna make a big difference is having that conversation. If one of your loved ones, one of your coworkers, or even yourself, you know, ask yourself, hey, am I having thoughts of ending my life, of harming myself? And if you don't know how to ask someone this question, maybe talk to someone else who you trust, who maybe feels a little more comfy being able to ask that question directly. Because if you think about it, when we start conversations with people, both in person and over Zoom or various telehealth modalities, one of the first things in the first five minutes of something is, hi, how's everyone doing today? How are you doing today? And we typically do that because it's become kind of like the norm. It's what we do. Um, But if we're going to have a meeting, right, that's stacked with things on the agenda and we're asking that question, hey, how are you doing? Are we really prepared to hear someone out for how they're really doing? Or are we just saying, okay, this is something I'm getting through because it's polite to do. So when it comes to suicide prevention, it's important to ask the question, but to have some time to, to sit down or to virtually talk to someone. And offer them that hope that with the proper assistance, their suicidal feelings can pass. Learning different techniques, you know, it's that that whatever is bringing them down, whatever they feel has no hope, there's always hope. And it's important to encourage them to seek help, you know, whether it is that you can be the bridge to a resource, give them a number or talk to their, you know, have them talk to their general practitioner or other health professional. And so right there, those four steps, and really just the bottom three, offering hope, company, and a bridge to resources, you would be doing suicide prevention. And so when it comes to resources, the following slide is going to have two that I really think all of us should really keep on our phone. Not necessarily saying because we may have to use it ourselves for our own person, but you never know if you encounter someone who may be in an emotional crisis. And so when I say offer your company, I'm not saying all of a sudden become, you know, a mental health interventionist and, you know, a psychiatrist and like a therapist and a guru all in one. Absolutely not. Because that can be overwhelming for you as well. But know your resources. So if you're ever in a situation, yourself or a loved one or a friend, and you see that they're going through an emotional crisis, 
and you're like, oh my God, I really don't know what to do. It's three in the morning or it's Sunday. And, you know, traditionally a lot of places may be closed or maybe I'm not sure if hospitalization is what they need. I just really don't know what to do, but I know that I want to do something. Offer them these resources. Actually, you can even call the line, the lifeline with them and, and stay on the line with them. And they'll be connected to a professional who has been trained on how to handle situations. And some of us or some younger populations may prefer texting. There's also a crisis text line. And so we need to not feel that stigma when we see that word crisis. Because crisis, if you think about it, it can be anything. Any moment that our heart rate goes up, usually our body enters something called diffused psychological arousal when our heartbeat reaches about 100 beats per minute. Many of us may have, you know, smartwatches or other fitness accessories that tell us like our heart rate and, and we might measure that. And so if you're actually not exercising and you're just sort of sitting down um, and you notice that your heart rate is elevated, you either feel that pumping or you, or you glance at your fitness watch and you see that it's at 100, your body is in that diffuse psychological arousal. And what that means is that in that moment, it's really hard for you to process your own emotions. So that's kind of like that crossroad point, which is, okay, I can either do some kind of positive coping mechanism to sort of bring myself down, bring my system down, or I may actually go into panic or it may affect my mood or it may just throw off my performance. I might make a mistake. I might not even make sense when I'm talking. So know that. And again, so this is a very physical symptom of something actually related to your mental health. And so as I say, mental health is health. And so these are two resources to have if, you know, if we all have a phone, whether we call or we text. And so if you would prefer in-person therapy or nowadays, you know, through Zoom because of the pandemic, um, and you're currently enrolled UT RGB students, we have the Counseling Center, which is, you know, it's been my home for five years. And those are in that Zoom grid, as you will see, um, is myself along with some other colleagues. And so at the Counseling Center, we're really your one-stop shop for college students enrolled in UT RGB and their mental health. We offer individual therapy, group therapy on different topics, and couples therapy. We offer presentations. We have a whole team of suicide prevention, body positivity. Um, and one of the most important and I think very useful resources is we have our own crisis line. And it's that 956 number that you see in yellow that we didn't write the 956, but I'm telling you, it's 956. So it's a local number. And this one is, again, it's, it's our very own crisis line. And they will be connected to a therapist within three minutes or less. That's, that's our rate is three minutes or less. And that will offer stabilization. They can bridge to hospitalization, bridge to other resources. And so we just want everyone to know in the college community that, hey, like they're not alone. And we know that suicide is pretty high in the college age population. Because if you think about it, a lot goes on during your traditional college years. So traditional college years would mean 18 to like 25. Usually that's when we're discovering, okay, well, what do I want to be when I grow up? And hey, now I'm like a full-blown adult and maybe I'm having my first like breakup and heartbreak. And maybe this is the first time I'm experiencing stress or anxiety in my life. Or man, my grades are not as amazing as they were in high school. Now that I'm in college, even though I'm putting just as much and or not more effort. And so all those changes can really do a number on our young population's mental health. So that's why we exist and our contact information is there at the bottom. And so while this is exclusively for currently enrolled students, the university has another resource that's for anyone in the community. And that's gonna be on the following slide. So through the Department of Counseling and Guidance, um, they have training clinics, one in Edinburgh and one in Brownsville. However, due to the pandemic, they had to get creative and they had to know, you know what, there's a need, we're going to make it happen. So they developed something called Dream Star Counseling. And so this is free therapy 
for the community and it's done via Zoom. And so this is not affiliated with the Counseling Center. This is affiliated with the Department of Counseling and Guidance within the School of Education. And so the important thing to know about this one is that, yes, services are free. However, please know that the therapists are graduate students who are doing their practicum and they're doing their internships. So that's sort of like they're getting that um, practice and the community is getting therapy. So obviously, again, you have to bear with them because, you know, you're going to know that they're they're beginning therapists, so they may be very green. However, we all start somewhere and we all have to learn somewhere. And sometimes, you know, as a member who may seek out therapy, we don't need like, um, you know, like a like a specialist, specialist, specialist. Maybe we just need someone to bounce ideas off, give us a couple of techniques to help us relax and manage our mood and stress management and self-care. And so this is an excellent resource for that. And know that um, if your case may be a little more elevated than something that they can handle with their clinical skills, they will refer you to another agency that either has pro bono or a sliding scale fee. So just so you know, Dream Start Counseling, and um, they don't have a phone number, but they have the website and their email. And you can actually book your appointment online at that web page directly. Okay, so do you want to go to the next slide, please? And so back to mental health matters. I think that's sort of, you know, the vibe I'm hoping to give off is that mental health is so important. And so basic ideas to take care of our mental health, even if, you know, maybe we're like, you know, I don't think I'm like, or maybe I want to go to therapy. However, please know that therapy is for everyone. It, you don't have to have a quote unquote issue, quote unquote diagnosis to seek therapy. Many people seek therapy as part of their wellness routine because they are in a good place emotionally and they want to keep it that way. And so therapy can sometimes serve as maintenance to our mental health well-being. But self-care is really at that core of our emotional health and our physical health. And so these are some ideas. And if you see they're broken down between physical things because we want to raise endorphins. So why do we raise endorphins? Endorphins are those things that naturally our body makes that makes us feel good. When we're feeling happy, when we're smiling, when we're laughing, those are endorphins helping you make that happen. And so other ways to do that is to just really get physical. And for our well-being, when it comes to our mind and emotions, research has shown that we need approximately 30 minutes of physical exercise four times a week to start reaping the benefits for our mental health. So this is not like, you know, to get your ideal perfect body, but it's going to be good to like center your mind and get your stress away and melt that away. 30 minutes, four times a week. After you do it for about three weeks, you're going to start feeling a little bit different. You're going to sleep a little better um, and, you know, try it out and see, see what happens. And if you think about it, we all have 30 minutes in our day. We really do. If we were to just break that down, we all have those 30 minutes. And so different ideas for how to take care of our mind. And so our emotions. And if you see there in the emotional one, gratitude is there. And so prior to being a therapist, when I thought of gratitude, I don't know about you guys, but I always thought about like, okay, being thankful and saying thank you and like Thanksgiving, to be honest. But what we know is that when it comes to gratitude for our mental health, it means something different. And the definition is on the next slide. But really it's about having the sense of appreciation for life, regardless of what a day you've had, regardless of what is going on, having that gusto and that appreciation for your life. That's really, in a nutshell, what it is. It can be a challenging skill to develop, especially if we tend to focus on, well, this is what went wrong in my day. Gratitude sort of teaches us to do the opposite, which is, okay, what's been good? Tell me what's good in your day. Talk to me about what was enjoyable. 
And so there are many ways to start practicing gratitude. And I want to share with you one that is really one of my favorites. So one of the things I really love is for us to find simple pleasures throughout our day. Because each day, regardless of how cloudy it may seem in our life or in our situation, has an abundance of opportunities to feel small, simple pleasures. So if you want to go to the next one, these, um, this is sort of how to start training our brain to start looking at that good and finding those simple pleasures. And I like to call them the three keys. So each day it can be at any time, whether it's in the morning, usually it's towards the later afternoon or evening part when we may want to try and foster this. That's when we've kind of slowed down. We want to reflect on our day. And many of us subconsciously reflect on our day, but we reflect on, man, this is what didn't go well, or this is a deadline I need to meet, or tomorrow I need to do this, this, and this. So we're planning, right? We're planning and we're processing, but many of us may not be stopping to actually see, okay, but what went well? Like, this was good. And so this is what the three P's is about. If every day we take a little bit of time at the end of our day to think about one person, that's the first key, that made us feel good, a person who was nice, and it doesn't have to be like this deep, like soul connecting moment, it can be, you know what, I went to go pick up since we're talking about caffeine with colleagues, you know, I went to go get a coffee at the drive through and, and the barista, you know, was really nice and they they smiled and it was an, it was an enjoyable moment or it might be like a nice email that we may have gotten or or courteous response okay that person made me feel good that's my that's my person piece and the second one is my favorite which is taking a moment to find out what was at least one pleasure that I experienced in my day so drinking our coffee can be a pleasure right if we're coffee drinkers Um, If we did some stretches, basically something that felt good. And pleasure is really anything that feels good to you. That's that's the big umbrella of what pleasure is. And so making note, this felt good. This felt good in me. This felt good on my body. This felt good. It can even be like, yeah, I felt the sunshine like today. And that made me feel good. It made me feel warm. Or if you like rain and it's been raining lately, you know what? The weather makes me feel good. That was pleasurable. And then, because remember, fostering hopefulness is really important too. So that's the third P, which is a promise. Something to look forward to the following day or in the future. And that's where our planning comes in because sometimes we're natural planners. And that's when, you know what? Like a lot of times we plan for the weekend. Like once the weekend is here, I'm going to watch this movie. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Or when I get vacation or when COVID is over. However, we don't have to wait that far long. We can literally make that promise today, Thursday, for tomorrow, tomorrow morning. You know, something I'm going to look forward to the next day. And so that kind of starts to brew gratitude and appreciation and helps us notice, hey, there's some good stuff going on in my life. Regardless of everything that may be going on, there's some good stuff in my life. And so you want to go to the next slide. This is my contact information. And I'm very, very grateful to have been given the opportunity to talk about not only UTRGV, but just general stats, community resources. And, you know, if you would like to continue this conversation, please, I have a social media, Love Interior Psychotherapy on Instagram. You can find me there. And I like to try and fill that page with kind of little tips and tricks, kind of like the ones I shared today with those three keys. Maria, this is Joe from South Texas Health System. You did an excellent job. Thank you so much. I think oh, this is very helpful. They're very helpful. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, one of the most important things is that we, when we're talking to someone about suicide is, or when they're talking to us about suicide is, for us not to be afraid to ask how you plan to hurt yourself. I think that's important because a lot of times people shy away from that. And uh, we always ask, do you have a plan? What is your plan? Because this is how we can help you. This is how we can help your family to remove weapons, to remove, you know, whatever from the house that you might be wanting to hurt yourself. But yeah, this is this is a great slide, and thank you so much. I appreciate. It. I will I will definitely share with my team here at the hospital. Thank you. Wonderful. 
I, I don't have a question. Hi, good morning. Uh, my oh. name is Lou. Um, but I wanted just to speak, um, as a prior student at UTRGV, I definitely utilized the counseling services on campus when I was there. Um, and it definitely provided, um, a really ne a necessary service. And then last year I actually went back to the, um, offsite, you know, to open to the public counseling center as well and utilize those services. So it's definitely a benefit. Um, that if you are, have the ability and the necessity to use them, I encourage everybody to do so um, because of the, you know, the help that I received through those two services, I'm able now to uh, implement a lot of the things that I've learned, techniques and things like that, and implemented them here at work for um, the members that we have in our co-working space. So mental health is definitely a big part of what we provide as a resource for the entrepreneurs who work out of our space. So I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, that's so lovely to hear. I'm so glad that, you know, it's the one thing is for, for, you know, a therapist or someone who works in the field to tell you, you know, try therapy, try therapy. And another one is for someone to be like, hey, you know what, I tried it and, and it was so helpful. This is, this is exactly the kind of conversation that, you know, I'm so thankful that you're passing it along and, and you, you know, you're being that bridge. So thank yeah. you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Well, it seems that we've approached 11 o'clock um, just on time. I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, uh, Mr. Joe Rodriguez with South Texas Health System Behavioral Center. Uh, thank you so much. We appreciate everything you do. And of course, you know, uh, we enjoy a great partnership for many years. And um, also want to thank uh, Maria with the UTRGV uh, Counseling Center. Thank you for being here. A great presentation. Um, and uh, we enjoy it. Once again, if you did sign up for uh, through Eventbrite, um, we'll go ahead and send uh, the, the slideshow and all the detailed information um, to your, your, your email. And of course, this video would be put on our website at edinburgh.com, and I also find it on Facebook. Um, but I want to thank you uh, again, and thank you for joining us for uh, Kathy and with colleagues. We're going to have another one next month. So please uh, stay tuned for that. But before we, we go off, you know, I want to also plug in the importance of filling out your census, um, getting registered to vote. All those things are time sensitive right now. And uh, we want to make sure that the community is aware of, of all these uh, uh, initiatives that are taking place. And uh, we hope that you can uh, fill out your census, get registered to vote in the upcoming election. And um, I want to thank you again. And um, thanks again, Ms. Rodriguez, Maria. Thank you. Thank you for it's a pleasure. Me. I'd like to invite all of you also uh, from, from the chamber and also from UTRGV uh, to visit our facility, to visit our hospital, so you can see and erase that stigma that we have, you know, like you mentioned. So you're more than welcome at any time to just give us a call and uh, the, you can ask for me. I'm available 24 hours, seven days a week also. So call me and we can set up a tour so you all can see our hospital. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you all have a great day. Um, enjoy your coffee and uh, have a great week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.